Welcome to Mom of Eight Momversations on the Win Win Women Network. We are so grateful for this platform and the behind the scenes friends making it all work smoothly so we women can gather to care, connect, and collaborate. Truly a win win for us all. I'm your hostess, Reagan Barnes, mom of eight and founder of Mom of Eight. We are a nonprofit organization that empowers you to elevate your mothering experience. We're so excited to have you join us here today on our show. We welcome you into our Mom of Eight community or mom unity, as we like to say. We are moms united in our passion to create a better world for our children, with our children, and through our children. Join us and become a mom, a mom unity member. It's free on our website, momofate.org. And when you join our virtual mom unity, we'll send you a free digital copy of our smile journal where you can keep track of what you learn from each of these mom versations and set goals to impact your personal achievement based on this educational program. Let's get this mom versation started. Here at Mom of Eight, we answer the question, what do moms do? With this uplifting statement, moms raise up society. That's right, not just our own kids, but all of society, including ourselves. This acronym is jam packed with the far reaching impact of intentional mothers who strive to improve and progress in these areas of motherhood. We're not just chauffeurs and short order cooks as we repeatedly do bedtime routine and load after load after load of laundry. It makes an impact that goes beyond our homes because as moms, we are uniquely positioned to influence society one-on-one -on -one as we take on the repetitive, loving work that shapes our children and shapes us too. Today, we're going to focus on the category of atmosphere and get even more specific and dig into the subcategory of touch. At Mama Bait, we know that part of motherhood includes creating a home atmosphere. And we explore this centuries old art of homemaking through this lens of the five senses. And today we'll hone in, we'll narrow down and focus in on how we can interact with ourselves and our family members through our bodily sensation of touch. Um, so in that concept of atmosphere and um, how we came to this idea of exploring that from all five senses. That comes from my background as a doula. You might not be familiar with that term. It has to do with the time frame of childbirth. So when a woman is pregnant and looking forward to childbirth or being really scared about childbirth, um, she might hire a doula or simply invite a good friend to come and be with her during that laboring time frame. So I had that, have had that opportunity to serve as a doula, um, mostly for friends and family. I, I really didn't take it on much as a profession, but one of the ways that I would help my uh, friends and clients through the difficulties, it is a challenge, right, to give birth, um, was ahead of time. We would meet and we would talk about um, mentally where they could go when they didn't want to be focused on the pretty major intense sensations of contractions. And uh, we called this our place of peace. And again, it was a, it was kind of a mental, I don't want to call it a game. It was, it was almost like hypnosis really to find out 
in, in terms of those five senses, where your place of peace is. So I'll just give you, for instance, um, the, the sensation of hearing for me. Um, that would be a the sound of water running like a waterfall. And that turned out to be a great place of peace sensation for giving birth because I also enjoyed the help of water, um, like being in a bathtub and having that warm water. So keeping the bathtub water running also helped in terms of my sense of hearing for that childbirth. Um, and then, of course, there's the sense of smell. And for some women, they wanted something very relaxing, like the smell of lavender. Or for some women, it would be more of like a citrusy, energetic type of smell that would help them through the contractions. Uh, so that's kind of where this idea came from when we determined that um, we wanted our homes to be a place of peace, too, right? And so um, <laughs> not to say that it's always as intense as childbirth in our homes, <laughs> Um, but we do recognize that it's through those five senses and, and even a sixth sense, right, that's like intangible, that we can create a place of peace for our families, for ourselves. Um, that's really the beauty of the work of motherhood is we might be doing it for the sake of our family or our kids, but it benefits us too. Uh, so um, with this sense of touch, as I was thinking that through just here in terms of my household and my family, I was thinking, what, what does that mean for our homes? It's maybe soft blankets, or um, I really like my soft jammies. Um, and I just found out, by the way, a way to keep those kinds of synthetic softy things really, really soft when you wash them is to never put them in the dryer, just air dry them and they will keep that softiness. They won't pill, you know, has them, uh, at least for me, some of my favorite softy things have become all pilled and hardened. Um, so there's a little tip for you on those soft things. But um, so it did expand from there though, like it's not really just about soft blankets, although they're wonderful, right? Um, as I had interactions with, uh, I have a nephew with autism, I have um, other friends whose children have autism, and it became a major concern that way in terms of sensory disorder is one way that it's sometimes referred to. Um, it might just be called um, high sensitivity or, uh, but it's things like feeling the seam of their sock in just the wrong place in their shoe and how they, they aren't able to concentrate on anything else because of that seam in their sock. And I, I have heard that there is such a thing as seamless socks now. So <laughs> that can solve that problem. But, um, but that's just an example of how uh, some of our beloved children are on that autism spectrum and they do have those special sensory needs in terms of what they are feeling. You know, the, the fabrics that we put on might be feel really starchy to them, especially depending on what kind of uh, detergent they've been washed in, things like that. So that's an example too of considering this sensation of touch and, um, and so if you have a child that fits on that autism spectrum and you need to kind of become more aware of what might be keeping them from being able to concentrate on anything else because of a sensory disorder in that way. And, and then being able to meet those needs more effectively once you're aware of them. And um, we'll use the word sensitive. <laughs> if you can, as the mom, uh, kind of be on their team and help them figure that out and how to manage those sens sensory needs um, to, to their benefit. So um, as we continued to develop the Raise Up acronym and we became an official nonprofit and we started inviting other women to join our team, we invited a, um, well, she found the opportunity to volunteer. We didn't actually know her ahead of time, but her name was Julie and she um, volunteered to join our team and wanted to take on specifically this area of atmosphere. Uh, after a couple of weeks, she decided that um, she needed to put her attention in other things. But during those couple of weeks, it was actually interesting because I think she was meant to be 
part of our team, even if just for that time frame, because when she heard this idea of the atmosphere and relating it to the five senses and this concept of touch, her brain spoke up and uh, was contemplating it with regards to good touch, bad touch, and how our families can be affected when we are um, touching our children in the right ways or our spouse or um, when our children might be being touched in ways that are detrimental to them. Um, hopefully never by us as mothers, but that does happen, unfortunately, um, that sometimes mothers touch their children inappropriately. And so we want to take some time here on our momversation to um, explore what is good touch versus what is bad touch. And some people are really uncomfortable with um, such polarized terms as good and bad. Um, of course, the fact is there are opposites in life, right? But we could use other terms like positive touch versus negative touch. Um, other ways to talk about it might be appropriate touch versus inappropriate touch. Um, healthy touches versus unhealthy touches. Um, so in general, uh, we will use the good and bad. And if that is uncomfortable for you, I hope that you'll be able to uh, translate that as uh, necessary to still gain and benefit from the conversation or momversation, as we like to say. Now, um, the, let's kind of focus on the good for a few minutes at first. Um, I know that it's, um, it's obvious that one of the best ways that we can um, touch our children is hugging. And I um, wrote a blog post a while ago um, with regards to hugging, and so I'm going to refer to that. Um, to hug or not to hug? Is that even a question? As I was growing up, hugging didn't happen much in my family. My mom had been molested by her stepfather, so her subconscious reaction was to respect her children's personal space to the point where we just didn't hug. Uh, then my older sister learned in a college class, so this is pretty far along in our child childhoods, uh, she was in college, but she learned about the importance of hugging and how this physical act has many benefits, uh, even psychologically. So she started hugging, bless her heart. <laughs> she uh, lived in the dormitory and she put up a sign that said free hugs. Um, and when she came home to visit for the holidays where I still lived, this was my older sister, she would hug us. Um, it was rather awkward, <laughs> but she was convinced that she could change our family culture um, so that we could all gain from this, this uh, blessed opportunity, the, the promised blessings of embracing one another. So. Of course, hugging really is best if it's a two-way thing. <laughs> so most of us hugged her back, kind of playing along with her little game. Um, we did kind of treat it as a game. If she patted us on the back during a hug, we would emit a burp as though we were babies who had swallowed air while feeding. But I'm glad that she got us hugging because I married into a hugging family although they don't appreciate the fake burps. <laughs> so to be honest, hugging still is not second nature to me. Um, I'll admit that. Um, hug my kids more often has been a New Year's resolution that I've made more than once. Um, gradually, I have learned to hug more freely and commonly and recognize the power that hugging has in making a relationship whole. 
Since I've experienced both the hugging and the non-hugging life, I feel authorized to declare that it is definitely better to hug than not to hug. Over 20 years ago, I received an email that listed some facts about hugs. I don't have a source to give credit to, and for that I apologize. It was back in the days of chain letters that claimed that a curse would come upon you if you didn't pass along the email to all of the contacts in your address book. But this particular email assured the recipient you are under no obligation to forward this electronic hug. For once, no bad luck will befall you if you don't want to or don't have time to keep this moving. Uh, so I thought that was kind of funny. But here came the list of reasons why hugs are so great. Hugs are all natural. No preservatives, artificial ingredients, or pesticide residue. They are cholesterol-free, naturally sweet, 100% wholesome, and they're a completely renewable natural resource. Hugs are not fattening, and they don't cause cancer or cavities. They don't require batteries, tune-ups, or x-rays. They're non-taxable, fully returnable, and energy efficient. Hugs are safe in all kinds of weather. In fact, they're especially good for cold or rainy days. They're exceptionally effective in treating problems like bad dreams or the Monday blahs. Hugs are free to give and free to get. There is no minimum age requirement. There are many different types of hugs. Hugs of sadness and hugs of joy. Loose hugs with a kiss on the cheek. Big bear hugs and pat on the back hugs. As mentioned before, do you need to burp. You can hug hello and you can hug goodbye. You can hug a human, a pet, a stuffed toy, a tree. You can even hug yourself. Hugs can warm you from the cold and comfort you when you are scared. You can hug while you dance. You can hug while you sleep. There is no time limit on giving a hug. Hugs never go out of style. There is no restriction on how many hugs you can give. Hugs cross all kinds of boundaries, racial, personality, age, social, financial. Hugs are love. Hugs are caring. Hugs feel good. Never wait until tomorrow to hug someone today. So I just feel like this makes me want to hug all of you. So I'll just take a minute. Here we go. Oh, nice big hugs out to my wonderful mom of eight, mom unity. Um, I really have noticed a difference as I have worked to put hugs into my family culture. Um, and I can say that kids benefit from hugs. I can also say that um, sometimes it's a little awkward, but most of the time the child agrees that the hug is worth it for getting through that awkwardness. Now, um, that's my spiel, I guess, on the good touch. And of course, we could take some time and maybe we will during our interactive part to talk about other kinds of good touches. Um, at this point, we will transition a little bit to talk about the bad touches or negative or unhealthy or inappropriate touches. This is critical, moms, because the majority of molestations happen with someone we know. Uh, you might have heard as I was reading the blog post about hugs that my mom was molested by her stepfather. She didn't tell anyone until she was in college, at which time she did call and talk to her mom, who immediately divorced the man. Um, but that was just the beginning of things for my mom. So many of those memories had been repressed that they didn't come about to haunt her again until she was married and was really interested in having a normal and beautiful sexual relationship with her husband. Uh, but again, those memories came at that time, unfortunately, and made 
that sexual relationship very, very difficult, um, a, a major obstacle. And my parents' marriage did not last, unfortunately, for a wide variety of reasons, but I feel confident that that contributed um, to the, the demise of their marriage. Now, um, I also had a neighbor um, she was about 16 and she was, I like to call her my starfish. Uh, have you heard the um, kind of a metaphor or analogy, right, of an old man at the beach and uh, it was kind of the morning time frame when the um, tide was going back out and he was going, he was noticing that a lot of starfish along the shore had been um, left there. Um, and would die if they weren't re-submerged into the water. So he was throwing starfish out into the water, but there were hundreds and hundreds of starfish. A fellow beach walker came by and said to the man, you are never going to accomplish your goal of getting all of these starfish back in the water. Like that's just impossible. And um, the man picks up one more starfish and he said, well, I saved that one. And that's who Melissa was to me. She um, didn't have a lot of positive role models in her life. She was having a really difficult time with schooling and wasn't actually attending very much, uh, but was leaving school. Once her mom would drop her off, she would leave and basically um, submit herself to being molested by uh, gangs of boys. Um, and as her mom was telling me about these things, I said, would you like to let Melissa come hang out at my house instead of going to school? I mean, she's 16. She doesn't legally have to attend school anymore. And she might really enjoy being around my kids. Melissa did really like kids. And at the time, I think my oldest was only eight. So I had lots of little kids <laughs> for her to hang out with um, and hopefully distract her a little bit from a lot of the negative attention that she was getting from the boys who really didn't have any respect for her at all. Um, well, as Melissa joined my household, um, she became very open about uh, her past. And it was frightening, really, to realize in, in her case, her stepfather not only molested her, but invited friends to come and molest her. She would wake up in the middle of the night um, feeling men touching her in places that were meant to be just for her. Um, and it was, it was very heart-wrenching to hear these stories um, for, from a teenage girl. Um, so uh, then I um, can tell you just myself, being, I think I was maybe six or eight years old, but we had a neighbor that I liked to go hang out at his house. He was about my same age, maybe a little older. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he had been exposed to sexuality a lot earlier. I, I think there might have been pornography in their home. Um, and so he decided to show me his parts and ask to see my parts. And um, while I don't necessarily consider that to have been a molestation type of thing, um, it was a pit in the stomach type of thing. And I'm actually in some ways grateful that it happened when it did and as minor as it did, because it taught me certain lessons like about private parts and allowed me to have enough of the negative experience to know that I wanted something better for myself. Um, so as moms, it, the ways that we can talk about these things is being very straightforward. Talking with our children about the word, that's kind of a buzzword these days, the word consent, and helping them understand what this means and applying it even at very young ages. I have a three-year-old, she's my youngest, and um, so she has lots of older brothers and sisters <laughs> who are very interested in how cute she is. And they almost can't help themselves. They just want to kiss her right away, as soon as they see her, whether it's first thing in the morning or when they've gotten home from school. And we have decided that it's actually critical 
essential, crucial for her to give her consent. And at this point, she is so overkissed that she rarely gives her consent, <laughs> to be honest. And um, and it, it's so hard for my big kids. They just want to kiss that cute little fat baby cheek face. Um, but I'm proud of them for deciding to respect that. And, and sometimes I put it in context of what's going on in their lives and how important that consent would be if they were on a date or something to that effect. Um, we do want to teach our children hygiene skills um, and that it's absolutely good and normal for us to touch our own body parts and to feel comfortable with them. Teach, teach our children the beauty and the power of our bodies. And it's when they appreciate their bodies and they don't consider them to be dirty or they don't consider them to be um, untouchable, right? That they will then um, have the self-confidence to say no or um, yell and scream if there is a situation where they're being touched inappropriately. Um, that ties in with the idea of boundaries, of course, um, helping them know if, like I've heard moms talk about the swimsuit as an illustration, that if it's part of your body that is covered by a swimsuit, then it is yours and you own that and that is your boundary and you decide um, who's going to touch it and who's not going to touch it. And uh, this fits in with the concept of sexuality and helping our children want to um, appreciate sex as a beautiful part of marriage and that it's one of the best things that makes your marriage strong. And so save it. And, and don't give permission to touch those body parts until marriage. Um, calling our body parts by the right names. We could practice that <laughs> during the unrecorded portion. Um, we can all just say vagina together or penis, um, but helping our children know that they're, that's a, a totally fine term to know and talk about and feel comfortable with and be proud of the body parts that we have. Um, and even discuss how touches that are unwelcome might feel good because that's what hormones mean. Um, and so that's not a bad or wrong thing that if you are touched um, inappropriately, it still might feel good. And so being able to sort that out in your head um, is important for our children to understand. So um, it's also critical to help our children decide ahead of time who they will trust if they need to tell something. Um, and I think that we'll, we, we can have a lot more to talk about um, as we transition from this recorded session. And if you've been watching this as a recording, thank you. We're so grateful for your um, being willing to look through the archives and find something that would be of use to you as a mother. We invite you to join us in the future um, watching our um, full show and coming and being with us live so that you can interact with us during that second portion, the, the 30 minutes that are unrecorded. We would love to have your input, have a chance to do a Q&A with each other. Um, and that just makes when when women have the power that it is meant to have as a platform where we care and connect and collaborate with each other. Um, we look forward to inviting guests on our show. So if you would ever like to be a guest on our Momversation show, please uh, visit our website, that's at mamavate.org. And um, that will give us the chance to, oh, there's a tab across the top where it says Momversations. And um, you can click there and it'll, uh, it'll drive you to the opportunity to apply to be on the show. It'll also show you where our archives are so that you can watch uh, previous recordings. Um, so again, we work through the Raise Up acronym. And if you have a specialty in any of those areas, we would love to have you join us as a guest on our Momversations show. Thank you again, and um, 
we will uh, talk to you later. <laughs>